that uh, President Biden has come out a couple of days ago about the fact that he had been speaking to President Mitterrand of France, who died in 1996. And he also said that he had been speaking to al Sisi, the president of Mexico, about the situation in Gaza. And I checked the um, uh, Spanish and South American press uh, periodically. And I was thinking perhaps the, um, I wonder whether the president of Mexico, um, López Obrador, came out with an official statement saying not me or something like that. But uh, I don't find anything. I, I don't think he did. It's probably the best thing to do diplomatically. But what I find is a lot of memes coming from Mexico. You know, you know the mariachis, the singing groups who go around serenading you and everything. You know the guitars and the big Ameri uh, the big uh, Mexican sombreros, <laughs> and they are there singing, ay 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 ay, <laughs> and they call themselves the 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 three amigos. And uh, they have um, Biden and uh, Netanyahu and uh, Zelensky and all kinds of things. Anyway, it was perhaps a good thing that um, the Mexican president didn't actually react to it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, my two cents here about the uh, interview, the famous interview. Just, just few thoughts on that. My reaction actually to, to Putin and to Tucker Carlson. And I've come out of that interview thinking, my goodness, NATO is being used to tear Europe apart. Okay, let me, let me, let me go uh, stage by stage. First of all, the impression of Putin, who started with about half an hour of a history lesson there, very much very comfortable, sitting relaxed, and very much sort of the, uh, the professor of history. And uh, you can see that um, Taka Carlson, I think he said that at the end, as, a, as, a, as an introduction to the interview, that uh, he thought at the very beginning, he let him speak for a while, but then he started thinking, is he filibustering me, you know, and he became a little bit irritated and was trying to cut him off and interrupt him and so on. But he later, as he relaxed and so on, he later thinking about it and studying it came to the realization that no, that was not Putin's intention, um, he didn't think. Anyway, history. So <clears throat> I think the first impression is that to an American audience at any rate would be first of all that this person, Putin, is not a maniac. Uh, his uh, long introduction uh, to the history of the conflict. It is important, uh, I hear that Russians have a very strong sense of history. I have uh, heard comments about even cab drivers look at situations always from a historical perspective. This is not difficult to understand about an old country. Um, Americans, on the other hand, always seem to start in the third act of the play. You know, they, they forget the first and the second and they start there at the third. So everything started on the in Gaza on the 7th of, uh, 7th of October or everything started on the 22nd of February with Ukraine 2022. Uh, Alexander Mercurius of the uh, Duran actually pointed out something that perhaps um, I certainly hadn't noticed it 
and that is that when he was talking, when Putin was talking about the Minsk agreements and how um, France and Germany um, were supposed to be the guarantors, and then we learned, we all know that, we learned that, uh, no, that was just an excuse to allow, to, to give Ukraine time to be um, uh, armed and so on. But he noticed that um, actually there was another incident where France and Germany were also involved and that is that during the Istanbul negotiations when they had practically reached an agreement and then Boris Johnson came to dismantle the whole thing but um, that part of the negotiation to that agreement was that the troops that were coming to Kiev <coughs> would be would retreat would go back and that was part of uh, of the agreement and so they did and then after they did um the uh, the, the west started saying that all oh, the russians are losing they're retreating and so on and he noticed that actually putin said that france and germany were part of the negotiations there in, in an indirect way knew that the reason why they the troops went back from Kiev was part of those negotiations and nevertheless France and Germany allowed the Western media to go on with the narrative that the they were retreating in fear okay that was another sort of uh, um, stab in the back, as it were. I've been listening also to the French uh, historian, uh, one or two French historians. One of them is Emmanuel Todd, and uh, the other one, which I have forgotten his name and I didn't write it down, but um, he was giving an interview, and this is his thesis that perhaps World War II did not actually end in 1945, that World War II ended in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union. And at that moment, World War III started. What do you think about that? And he gives his reasons, uh, he goes on and on. Um, a series of continuous wars, infinite wars. And his thesis is, look, Russia is the anointed rival of the United States. The United States also wants to continue to dominate Europe so Russia and Europe is uh, a dangerous thing so Russia has to be continuously and continually weakened and Europe is there in the middle and he says NATO is being used to tear Europe apart Europe, he says, missed the boat. There was an opportunity to for for Europe or the European Union uh, to actually become something through the European Economic Community and so on, but ended up, due to its weak weak leaders, subjugating itself to the United States. Instead of uh, being an isolated uh, or an independent, let's say, power, that uh, it's behaving as, it, as if Europe had agreed to be under some articles of confederation with the United States. In other words, he concludes, Europe is less, as a whole, is less than the sum of its parts. Don't know what you think of that, but uh, well, let's continue. 
Putin uh, came through to me as a responsible person in this sense that I think he looks at things long term, has a long vision of the future. Um, responsible also because he didn't actually engage in insults or personal attacks or name calling. He did use subtle irony a couple of times, yes, but he does have a long-term vision. Why? Because I think he, many reasons, but one of them might be that he knows that eventually he might have to enter into negotiations with those leaders in the future. So he does not want to insult the future. Uh, from other nations we see a lot of name calling, and, you know, a few jokes also referring to putting um, jokes in order to, you know, gain voters at that particular time. Also because of uh, permanent media coverage. You have to feed the media, you have to come up with things, you know, all the time. Now, I'm old enough to remember the days when, you know, we just had uh, three television channels, uh, and um, or two, or one. And I do remember that the news uh, were read, broadcast in the evening for an hour in one channel, then another hour in another channel, half an hour here. But uh, once a day or twice a day, but something changed with this new, it started in the 80s with, you know, uh, 24 hours, well, not 24 hours, but practically, you know, the whole day with news. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, when these channels first started, I remember thinking, how can you have one channel continuously devoted to politics, who is going to watch that channel? Well, in fact, we did. But instead of uh, hearing political discussions and debates, politics was changed into entertainment, practically. You know, like another soap opera or something. So you have to be continuously feeding this thing, this beast. And that's probably one of the reasons why. Okay. Um, so, uh, history. Yes, Russians very much aware of its history. They, uh, as I said, the, the, uh, they can give you a historical perspective for everything. Also, uh, the Tucker Carlson there, as I said, was becoming a little bit irritated at first, and he was interrupting with all this history. And it brought to me the, the clash, the difference in, in culture, in, uh, the differences in culture. And I also thought at that time of our students in the West, young people who are uh, sometimes, I thought, we will Americans or people in Western countries watch this, uh, this 30 minutes of history or will they just get bored and walk away? Because we do have a problem that um, we see in our youngest students that uh, I was a teacher and they are incre increasingly unable to, to, um, to focus, to, 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 to center their attention for a, long, for a long while, for a period of time. It is an inability to focus. Uh, I think that this is the result of uh, undisciplined behavior, undisciplined use of technology, undisciplined use of uh, drugs and other medicaments. This undisciplined way of um, looking at the world, of uh, uh, inability to focus, that that is a problem. I don't know how many 
people, young people, well, you know, everybody left the interview when confronted with that half hour of history. I also found putting this creed. Uh, and in contrast, what came to my mind is the um, the immodesty, the incompetence of our leaders. And I have to come back here to the issue of arrogance and conceit, which I keep coming back to it, but I feel so strongly about it. But I do feel that arrogance put away even the moral issue, that arrogance is not even a good tactic, it's a good strategy. Arrogance is going to trip you up, always. It's going to trip you up into a false sense of security, really. So you see, you, 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 you go with your nose up, not looking at the ground, and, uh, and uh, you might not even be aware that you have stepped onto a banana peel or something. So off you go thinking that, you know, down this slippery slope, sliding on a banana peel, and you think you're ice skating or something. Uh, I, I, I find this uh, counterproductive, not to speak in the in the moral part of it. Uh, another thing he says when he's asked about negotiating with uh, to call President Biden and so on, and he asks the question, negotiate with whom? Uh, that was quite an original response, I think. Um, and he been pointed to the fact that he can talk to many presidents. He gave the examples, and nevertheless, then they come back and say no because the whoever is in power or has more power than the president will disagree. But what is clear to me is that all the things that he says about negotiations that. The United States has really been uh, pushing and pushing Russia, I think, for the last 24 years, and it has not stopped. In other words, Russia is our eternal enemy. We will go on fighting it one way or another forevermore. What I understood, I think what he said clearly, is that why would he invade Poland or the Baltic states? I actually do believe him there because, I mean, you only have to look at the map of Russia. Look at, the, look at Russia, how big it is. Why would they need to start taking bits of Europe now. I remember putting a while back saying that what they want in Russia is stability. He said, I remember him saying, we've had our, our uh, we had enough revolutions, thank you very much. We have had our share of instability and revolutions. We just want to, you know, create, you know, improve the economy, a certain sense of stability, why would they now start invading Europe? I, I do believe that he is honest when he says this. Uh, I think he showed patience and prudence. He was restrained in his criticisms and he was measured in his responses. For example, with the North Stream question, um, he says, um, who, who, in whose interest was it? You know, who benefits the qui bono thing? In whose interest was it? And who has the capacity to do it? Now you put two and two together and you reach your own conclusions. 
remember that at first, the first reaction was that it, it, it was Russia who had done it. Well, uh, you know, we all know that in that area, the Baltics in general, that, uh, that, that area is so heavily monitored. Come on. I don't think a, a, a fish goes across without being spotted in some in some sort of way. Remember also that we now know that the uh, plan, the file for the uh, blowing up of the pipeline, was ready from June 2021. And when it actually happened was the day after the opening of the Norway. Poland pipeline. Norway uh, has been helping the USA with a lot of things since the Vietnam era, heavily involved there. Now this, this uh, um, historian, this French historian says that the US has been pursuing two contradictory objectives all the time. Listen to this, he says, for example, in World War II, they used uh, Russia to negotiate with Germany to attack the Germans, but at the same time, they used the Nazis, the Germans, to combat Russia. They used, they financed the Shah of uh, Iran, and at the same time, they financed and helped the Ayatollah at first. In the Middle East, I lost count. I mean, they finance this group and then the other, and it's, uh, in other words, destabilizing countries, and then uh, use them. They f they first of all finance them, and then they become their enemies, having been their friends. So he says. Pursuing contradictory objectives. You finance Hamas and then Hamas, you fight Hamas, you be, it becomes your enemy. So at the moment, the strategy is weaken Russia. Remember what we were told at first Russia invaded uh, Ukraine and provoked. A democracy and so on. We now know we well we want that they want Russia as weak as possible because this historian maintains Europe and Russia together might be a threat, could become a threat to American hegemony not a military threat, not even perhaps an economic threat, but the mere fact that the US will not be able to control it. That's the threat, that Europe and Russia together might be, might become a little bit too independent, who knows. They might even decide to have good, a good relationship with China their main competitor. So keep weapon, uh, weakening Russia. And this time it is the Ukraine that is being used. In other words, we cannot defeat it, Russia militarily. So keep going, Ukraine. And when you run out of Ukrainians, you're always, you always have the Poles or the Georgians or whoever, the Baltic state. So they're now uh, financing and uh, being very friendly with the country, countries in the East, in the Baltics, flattering them. You are our friends now, playing perhaps in their sense of insecurity or even inferiority. They are fattening them to get them ready for their St. Martin's Day. I don't know whether you know what I mean by that. In all peasant societies, 
you fatten the pig yeah and eventually you will slaughter the pig uh, in the season of uh, October November normally is in my own particular peasant society on St. Martin's Day in November and so there is a saying, a proverb, that every pig has its St. Martin day. In other words, everyone come, comes to his own day of reckoning. Everyone gets their just desserts at the end. Now, about uh, President Zelens Zelensky and the Ukraine, it seems as if they have, it's terrible to say, but they might have been playing them along. Um, they have given him enough not to lose outright straight away, but not enough for victory. Um, the objective here, as I said, is to weaken Russia and at the same time eat or munch up Europe, starting with Germany. It's actually quite predatory. So the CIA might be engaged always on uh, the destabilizing operations in different forms and in the West the cultural wars so-called might be a form of destabilizing society to divide all these issues of the ecology and the inclusion and eh, all these things dividing the population, no cohesion in the population, destabilizing the population, weaken the country. So we have to consider whether we are in the West living in a democracy or whether we are living in an oligarchy. And whether democracy is actually an alibi now. Uh, because our leaders in the West, it seems to me, for some of them, the first question is, how do, what do I have to do to be approved by the main oligarchy, globalist or otherwise? In other words, the paradigm has changed and we haven't quite noticed that. That's all. So when he was asked, are you going to invade Poland? He says, why? I have other things, <laughs> we have other things to do. So anyway, my conclusion is this. From the American point of view, it is easier to blame, to pinpoint always to Russia as the eternal enemy rather than to admit that the US, however much of a friend you think you are, in the end you will be disappointed because they will fail you. They have many suitors but there is, it's like it's like going from one young mistress, she gets old, and then you get another one, and you get another one. You are disposable, as it were. You know, Gramsci, the Italian communist, he died in prison, uh, I think 1929, and he wrote a very famous... Marxist communist book notes from prison uh, notebooks from prison I think is the title of it and although he was a Marxist he he's the one who first came out with the word hegemony 
even though he was a true Marxist, uh, he criticized a little bit the works of Karl Marx in the sense that he thought that Karl Marx had concentrated only on the economic aspect of things and hadn't given enough importance to the superstructure, to the culture, religion, and so on. That is where the soft power comes, yes. And uh, he, uh, he he said a fame. He had a famous saying. He says, "The old world is dying. The new one has is not yet born. And in this chiaroscuro, in this light and shade, in this twilight, monsters emerge." And we are here fighting monsters. We are here in this state of continuous hysteria in the West, piloted by oligarchs, I think. And it, do you agree with NATO being used to tear Europe apart? And so I come back to how I started with the mariachi singing I, 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 I can't die no you're sing do not weep but how can we not weep with hundreds of thousands of people dying in Ukraine and in Gaza We're all living in a strange land at the moment. Thank you for listening. Bye-bye.